The battle of Armageddon is coming. Who are the good guys and who are the bad guys? What does the Bible really say? That's our topic on His Voice today. Welcome to another His Voice Today with Steve Wolberg. Welcome to the grand finale of a series of meetings that we've been doing on Israel issues. Uh, the first program, four programs ago, we talked about all eyes on Israel. And then the second program, we talked about Israel and Jesus Christ. And then in the last uh, presentation, we focused on titanic truths about the temple. And this is it, the grand finale. It's called Israel, Babylon, and Armageddon. We are going to take a close look at the book of Revelation and see what it, what it really says. Uh, who are the good guys, who are the bad guys that Revelation reveals will be uh, experiencing the final showdown at Earth's final battle called Armageddon. Let's start with the beginning of Revelation, chapter 1. Verse 1, the first line says, this book is the revelation of Jesus Christ. In other words, the book comes from Jesus, it is revealed by Jesus, and it is centered in Jesus. In verse 10, John, who wrote the book, said, I was in the Spirit. I was in the Holy Spirit when I got the book from Jesus. So obviously, uh, his spiritual faculties were in tune, and the Holy Spirit was inside of his heart. Going on in verse 11, John then heard a voice, the voice of Jesus, and he turned around to see who had spoken to him. Verse 12 says, I turned to see the voice that spoke to me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. Now, candlesticks, uh, this is basically Jewish imagery. It goes back to the, to the earthly temple where there was a seven-branched candlestick, uh, inside the holy place, there was also a table of bread, there was al also an altar of incense, and then inside the most holy place, there was an ark called the Ark of the Covenant, inside of which was the Ten Commandments. And so Revelation begins with temple imagery, and John sees Jesus walking in the midst. He's a great high priest, and he's walking in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. Now, what do these seven golden candlesticks represent? As Jesus then begins to explain to John what's going on in verse 20, Jesus says, I will explain to you the mystery of the seven stars which were in his right hand and of the seven golden candlesticks. He said the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven candlesticks, Jesus said, which you saw are the seven churches. So at the beginning of Revelation, Jesus takes the seven candlesticks, which uh, these have to do with Jewish imagery, and then he says the mystery of these candlesticks is that they represent the seven churches. So at the beginning of the book, Jesus takes the things of Israel, Jewish imagery, and he clearly applies it to his church. That's what Jesus does at the beginning of the last book of the Bible. Going on to chapter 2, Jesus then begins to give messages to these seven churches. The first church was Ephesus, then there was Smyrna, then Pergamos, then Thyatira, uh, and the list goes on all the way to Laodicea, which is the last church. Jesus has messages for each church. And in verse 18 of chapter 2, the angel of the church, to the angel of the church in Thyatira, write, and then Jesus gives a message to this church. And in verse 19, he talks about the good things that they were doing. But then in verse 20, he says, notwithstanding, I have a few things against you because you suffer that woman Jezebel, which calls herself a prophetess to teach and to seduce my servants. So to the church in Thyatira, Jesus says, uh, you, you've got a problem. The problem is that you've allowed that woman Jezebel to come right into the, into the church and to teach her deceptions. Now, uh, what's this talking about? Does, this, does, does Jesus mean that the ancient woman Jezebel, the literal woman who came into Israel, who married Ahab and brought all kinds of false, uh, false idolatry into Israel, did, did Jesus mean that she had been resurrected? 
did he mean that she has been reincarnated uh, and that she, you know, this literal lady uh, walked right into one of the churches in Thyatira and that the Christians were uh, falling for her deceptions? Is that what Jesus meant by this? No. Uh, we need spiritual eyesight to understand what Jesus is doing is he's using the history of Jezebel and, and Ahab. He's using uh, the woman, that woman, to represent a false form of Christianity. That just like Jezebel came into Israel, a false form of Christianity was coming in to his church and was bringing in its, its deceptions. And so, uh, once again, just like the seven-branched candlestick Jesus applied to the seven churches, Jewish imagery applied to the church. So he takes Jezebel, whose history had to do with ancient Israel, she came into Israel, and then he applied this to deceptions that were coming in to the church. There's consistency in the teaching of Jesus Christ in Revelation. In chapter 3, Revelation 3, verse 12, he talks about the need to overcome this is his counsel to the Philippian church. To him who overcomes will I make a pillar in the temple of my God. Now here Jesus is talking about God's temple. And the temple obviously again is, is uh, Old Testament imagery. There was a temple, a tabernacle in the wilderness in the days of Moses. It, was, uh, be it became permanent in the days of Solomon. It was destroyed by the Babylonians. It was rebuilt in the days of Ezra and Nehemiah, uh, and then it was later on there during the time of Jesus Christ, but it was destroyed in 70 AD by the Romans, and that temple uh, to this day has never been rebuilt over in Israel. So Jesus is here talking about temple, but what temple is he talking about? He's using the imagery of Israel, but he's applying this to his church. Jesus says that Christians who overcome will become pillars in the temple of my God, God's temple, and he will go out no more. And I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is the new Jerusalem. So here in verse 12, Jesus now uses Jerusalem itself. He talked about the candlesticks. He talked about Jezebel. He talked about the temple. And now he's talking about um, Jerusalem itself. And he is applying the temple of God and Jerusalem to a new Jerusalem. And Jesus calls this the city of my God, which is the new Jerusalem, which is going to come down out of heaven from my God and I will write upon him my new name. Verse 13, Jesus said, He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So the Holy Spirit speaks through these scriptures. And again, Jesus is using Jewish imagery, and he is applying it to his church and also to a new Jerusalem in heaven. Now let me just back up a little bit before we continue on and look at, look at Babylon. Uh, as we see from Revelation, so far, and we'll continue to see this. Uh, it's very clear that when you read the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible, that Revelation uses the geography and the terminology of the Middle East in its prophecies. There's no, no question about this. Uh, if you look at the whole picture, Revelation talks about 144,000 from all the tribes of the children of Israel. It talks about Mount Zion, Jerusalem, the temple. It also talks about Sodom, Egypt, Babylon, Euphrates. Euphrates drying up uh, because the kings of the east are coming from the east, and then it talks about Armageddon. And what's happening today is modern scholars are taking these Middle East terms and they're applying them to the literal places. They often apply this to 144,000 uh, Jews along the West Bank. When the Bible talks about Euphrates drying up in Revelation, they apply this often to Turkey building a dam to stop the flow of the river Euphrates. And when it talks about Babylon in Revelation 17 and 18, um, this is often applied to the sands of Iraq when uh, Saddam Hussein during the first Gulf War in 1991 was rumored to have been trying to rebuild or starting to rebuild the ancient city of Babylon not too far from Baghdad. 
uh, prophecy books came pouring off, off of the presses uh, saying that this was fulfilling prophecy. There it is. The ancient city of Babylon is coming back. So they apply it, applied it to that literal ancient city. Uh, temple texts are applied to a rebuilt Jewish temple in Israel and Armageddon is applied to a final battle north of Jerusalem in a valley, a small valley called Megiddo between um, sometimes it's China, sometimes Russia, sometimes Iran, Hezbollah, all these different forces that will gather together to fight against Jews. Uh, this is the way the landscape and the terminology of Revelation is interpreted today. But as we've already seen, uh, Revelation points us in a different direction in chapter 1 when Jesus takes the temple imagery, the seven-branched candlesticks, and applies it to the church. When he takes the imagery of Jezebel, who came into Israel, and applies that to deceptions coming into the church. When he takes the temple imagery and says that Christians can become pillars inside of that temple forever. When he takes the word Jerusalem, he applies it to the new Jerusalem, which Jesus calls the city of God, which will come down from heaven, uh, and we will then live inside that city forever. So, so far, we see um, Revelation using Middle East terminology, but it is, it is applying it to things very different from those literal, actual places. Now, let's keep going, and let's look at Revelation chapter 17, and then let's talk about Babylon. Actually, let's do a little bit more before we get to that. I'm looking at my notes here, and I don't want to leave out some things. Uh, Revelation chapter 21, 21, verse 10. The Bible says, John wrote, He carried me away in the Spirit. So the Holy Spirit was again leading John to understand these truths to a great and a high mountain. And that mountain was Mount Zion, a heavenly Mount Zion, a great and high mountain. And he showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem descending out of heaven from God. And so the holy city, the new Jerusalem, God's city came down and rested upon that great and high mountain. Revelation 11, verse 19, talks about the temple that is inside of the new Jerusalem. Verse 19 says, the temple of God. So the new Jerusalem is called the city of God. And this temple is called the temple of God, which was opened in heaven. And there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament. And there were lightnings and voices, thunderings, and a great earthquake, and a great hail. So John, in heavenly vision, sees the temple of God up there. He goes into the Holy of Holies. He sees the ark, and inside the ark, when you study the Old Testament and the book of Hebrews, inside the ark were the tables of the testimony, which were the Ten Commandments. So the temple described here is up there, and the ark is up there, and the focus is up there, not down here on earth. Continuing on in chapter 15, I'm sorry, chapter 14, 1412, John describes a people called the saints. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So these commandments are called the commandments of God. So the new Jerusalem is called the city of God. The heavenly temple is called the temple of God. Inside is the ark, and inside that ark are the Ten Commandments. And now we have a group of people here, uh, followers of Jesus Christ, who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. They're followers of Jesus, but they're keeping God's commandments, which are inside that ark, up in that heavenly temple, up inside the new Jerusalem, where Jesus Christ is our great high priest. In Galatians chapter 6, verse 16, Paul talks about Israel. And we've talked about this in previous programs. Galatians 6, 16, verse 15 says, In Christ Jesus, neither circumcision, which applies to Ju the Jewish people, avails anything, nor uncircumcision, which applies to Gentiles, but a new creature, that's what counts. And as many as walk according to this rule, peace be on them and mercy, and upon the Israel of God. So here, Paul talks about the Israel of God. 
Now in Revelation, we've got the city of God up there. We've got the temple of God up there. We've got people keeping the commandments of God, which are up there, as they're waiting for the Son of God to come down. And when Revelation talks about Israel in chapter 7, and the enemy being Babylon in chapter 17, um, is the Israel the Israel of God or some other Israel? And is Babylon a rebuilt city over in the sands of Iraq or is it another Babylon? Well, let's find out. Let's find out the answer. It's very clear. Going back to Revelation chapter 17, John in the spirit sees an, a mystery woman that is Babylon. Chapter 17, verse 3. John wrote, So he carried me away in the Spirit. So again, here's the Spirit. Revelation 1.10, John was in the Spirit. At the end of every message to the seven churches, Jesus said, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And here in Revelation 17, verse 3, John is again carried away in the Spirit, and he sees an amazing sight. He carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness and I saw a woman sitting upon a scarlet colored beast full of names of blasphemy having seven heads and ten horns. And then he describes the woman and in verse 5 John saw that upon her forehead was a name written mystery Babylon the Great the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. So the word Babylon is used. Now Babylon was an ancient city in Israel in Old Testament days. Just like there was a Jerusalem, so there was a Babylon. And there was a temple and uh, all the things that we've read about. There was a Jezebel that came into ancient Israel. Uh, so there was a Babylon that came and attacked Israel and destroyed the temple, destroyed the city, and took the Jews captive for 70 years. Now here Revelation uses that term, but is John through the Spirit being taught that this term applies to a rebuilt city over in the sands of Iraq about 50 miles south of Baghdad. No. We know that, that he's talking about something much different when he describes this mystery Babylon, this mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. She is sitting uh, upon many waters, it says in verse 1. The woman is sitting upon many waters. In Old Testament times, Ancient Babylon, this literal city, sat upon the river Euphrates, on the waters of Euphrates. And in Revelation, John sees another Babylon, and she's sitting upon the water. Many waters. But what does this water represent? If you look down at verse 15, the angel explains. The angel said to me, Revelation 17, 15, The waters which you saw where the whore Babylon sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. So the water isn't literal water. The water applies to all the people around the world that support this mystery Babylon and her deceptions. Now when we go to chapter 16, we read about the final battle. And Babylon is involved in this battle. And actually, let me, let me read another text I forgot. Uh, in chapter 18, verse 4, the Bible says, I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, come out of Babylon, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins and that you, you don't receive of her plagues. So God has people in Babylon. In ancient Old Testament history, literal Israel was taken to literal Babylon and they had to literally come out and go back to literal Jerusalem and rebuild their city and their temple. In Revelation, we have a mystery Babylon who sits upon the, the waters of uh, the people around the world that support her, and then God calls his people to come out of her, just like he called ancient Israel to come out of literal Babylon, he calls his modern Israel to come out of mystery Babylon so they don't share in her sins. Revelation 16 describes the final battle. Chapter 16 says, He gathered them together into a place called, in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. Now what is Armageddon about? Is Armageddon going to be a bloody Middle East war uh, against Jews? 
would that be a correct interpretation of this text? Uh, I don't believe so, and the reason is because that interpretation would go against the entire theme of Revelation in taking the landscape and the terminology of ancient Israel, but it applies it like the seven candlesticks were applied to the church. Jezebel was applied to deceptions coming into the church. The temple is applied to God's people and the temple up in heaven. Jerusalem is applied to the new Jerusalem up in heaven. Keeping the commandments of God is applied to the saints who follow Jesus Christ. Babylon is applied to a mystery woman that deceives the world. She's sitting upon the waters which represent people, multitudes, nations, and tongues. And so if we interpret Armageddon as a... Um, a bloody Middle East battle against Jews in a little valley north of Jerusalem, that interpretation which takes the Middle East terminology literally is contrary to the trend of the entire book, of the entire book. Now, let's just back up a little bit. The theory is that all the nations are going to gather into this little valley, this little valley north of Jerusalem, the valley of Megiddo. And the Bible doesn't actually use the word in Revelation, Megiddo. It says Armageddon. Uh, Har in Armageddon, Har means mountain, and Megiddo literally means slaughter. So this is a mountain of slaughter that uh, someone's being gathered to. Now who's being gathered into this mountain of slaughter? Chapter 14 and 15 gives us the answer. Going down to verse 13. Verse 13 says, I saw three unclean spirits, like frogs, coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. As we'll see, these are the three parts of Babylon. Verse 14 says, They are the spirits of devils, and they work miracles, and they go forth to the kings of the earth and to the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. So who's being gathered? And then verse 16 says, He gathered them to the place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. Who's being gathered? According to verse 14, 13 and 14, it is the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet gathering together the kings of the earth and the whole world for a final battle against God. That's the context. And then when you keep reading, verse 17 says, And then the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air, and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done. And there were voices, thunderings, lightnings, and a great earthquake such as was not since men were upon the earth so mighty an earthquake and so great. Uh, when they're gathered, when the whole world, all the kings of the earth, and all the forces of evil are gathered at this mystical place called Harmageddon, mountain of slaughter, then the voice of God booms from the sky, from the heavenly temple, says it is done, the earth quakes, a huge earthquake hits this planet, Verse 19 says that the great city, which is the city of Babylon, was divided into three parts, and those were the three parts of the forces of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. And the cities of the nations fall, cities all around the world. They collapse, Tokyo, Los Angeles, uh, London, Paris, Moscow, cities all over the world crumble. And it says, and great Babylon came in remembrance before God. Great Babylon is the, is the enemy. In Revelation. And at Armageddon, she comes crashing down with her worldwide global forces. She comes in remembrance before God to give to her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. So what's happening here is the global forces of Babylon come crashing down at Armageddon. I want to make three points. Three points from this section from the context. The context is very clear that Armageddon is, is global. There's the kings of the earth and the whole world gathered. Uh, the focus is the heavenly temple, not an earthly temple, and the context is the destruction of the global forces of Babylon that come crashing down. Great Babylon the Great. And obviously Jesus is going to have a people who don't go down with Babylon. They are his special people, his Israel, his Israel of God, who are on his side. Uh, Revelation 16, verse 15, right before Armageddon, Jesus says, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he who watches, who watches out for deception, and who keeps his garments, and the garments refer to the white robes of his righteousness. 
lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And he gathered them together into the place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. In verse 15, Jesus warns his church, his people, whose home is the New Jerusalem, the city of God, who are trusting Jesus Christ as their high priest, who is ministering in the temple of God, who are keeping the commandments of God, which is inside the ark, by the grace of God, because they love Jesus and they want to follow him. These people are keeping their garments, which is the garments of the righteousness of God, the righteousness of Christ that clothes them and that prepares them for the end. And these are the people who are ready for Armageddon. Babylon, Israel, the world forces of evil, God's people. A final battle in Revelation and the return of Jesus Christ to deliver his people and to put an end to uh, the deceptive, uh, horrific, uh, evil work of the enemy, of the devil, and of the forces of Babylon. Those are the sides. Babylon and Israel centered in Jesus Christ. And uh, as we've looked at this and looked at these verses, I just want to appeal to you to study Revelation, to give your heart to Jesus, to be on the side of God's people who are prepared, clothed in the white robe of his righteousness for the second coming of Christ and for the end of the world.